Well, brothers and sisters, uh, welcome to a slightly different format tonight uh, for our uh, Bible class. Um, obviously, very interesting times that we live in. Uh, things move rapidly and uh, very quickly. So uh, tonight, um, we're going to do a uh, recorded session and then put that on live stream uh, for your benefit. We're uh, super grateful to uh, Brother Dave Hill to be with us tonight to uh, give us a third in his uh, series on fellowship. Um, we've had two fantastic uh, sessions so far, and uh, we're super appreciative, um, Brother Dave, that you can join us tonight uh, under these circumstances and given everything else that's going on. I really appreciate it, so thank you. Um, before we get started, I will open with a word of prayer. Almighty Father in heaven, we are truly grateful that you are with us and you are in control. And we know this because you have been with us before and you have been with us in the past and with all the brothers and sisters and many of your faithful servants throughout the ages. Father, um, please be with us tonight as we hear about fellowship and how important it is and uh, how um, you have designed it for us to help and strengthen each other in these very specific times of desperate need. And, uh, and, and Father, we are truly thankful that you've allowed us to um, to have this uh, privilege of fellowship. Um, please be with us, with our hearts, um, and with all those who need your help and care at this time. Father, we thank you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Fantastic. All right. Well, um, Brother Dave, I will let you uh, get started. Um, and uh, I believe you're going to be doing a lot of Bible references, so we won't have a reading tonight. Right. Well, thanks, uh, F, just to make sure you can hear me just fine. Yep. Well, look, uh, good evening, brothers and sisters um, who share a, a light, precious faith. It is uh, somewhat sobering, isn't it, to be meeting under these circumstances yet again. But um, I'm certainly with you in spirit and looking forward to another good night together. I guess it's Bible classes in which we sometimes consider um, topics that certainly we wouldn't normally consider in a but it does us well in Bible classes to consider perhaps a bit more of an expositional look at some parts of the Bible. And tonight we're going to, in our third of this series on fellowship, look at, again, some of the verses which seem to suggest or, or encourage that disfellowshipping a brother or sister. And we just want to take a closer look at them uh, with a view to seeing perhaps what they uh, they were really intended for us to, to understand. So we're going to start in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. So if you've got your Bible handy, um, turn that one up, or I'll, but I'll be reading them out for you. So 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness. <laughs> and skipping down a little bit. We hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. And in verse 14, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. So you might ask, well, why do I include this one in the context? of fellowship or more pertinently uh, disfellowship. Well, the AV for verse 6 has that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. And I would proffer that that expression has been so grossly abused over the years in our community. It's an expression that's almost being used as a catch-all clause to justify disfellowship on all manner of grounds, being to constitute walking disorderly. And yet, as we'll see, the real irony is that it's perhaps never been used to disfellowship a brother or sister for the very behaviour about which the apostle was actually writing. You see, the word rendered withdraw in verse 6 is the Greek word stelo, and that means to set or place in order, to arrange. While the word disorderly is the Greek word atikos, atikos with the, um, which, which means to be 
out of order or out of step. So how then were these brethren and sisters out of step? Because that's what he says, you're disorderly, you're out of step. Well, it's because verse 6, they didn't walk in the way that the apostles they walked not in accord with the tradition that you have received from us. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labour we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. So what Paul was intending here is to bring these brethren back into line, verse 9, with the example that he had given the Thessalonians to imitate. So, brothers and sisters, in a nutshell, we can see really clearly that this section of scripture has absolutely nothing at all to do with withdrawing or disfellowship. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's all about restoring things to order, making things right in the ecclesia. And Paul's advice is that if such a brother refuses to hear or heed their counsel, we read this in verse 6, he says, if anyone does not obey what we've said in this letter, take note of this person and have nothing to do with him. Now, the Greek there is really more appropriately rendered, do not mingle with him, don't mingle with that person who's not interested in, in not being a burden or, or working and earning their income. And, and in case you're thinking, oh, is that a bit of a stretch? Is, is, is David using a bit of license there? Well, actually, no, because it's the exact word used of Nicodemus who brought a mixture of myrrh and allo aloes to Jesus, and also the wine mixed with gall that was given to Jesus at his crucifixion. So Paul's saying, don't get mixed up in their behaviour. Why? That the brother might be ashamed um, of the way they're uh, living uh, their life. And now that Greek word rendered ashamed is entropo, entropo. And that actually means to reverence, respect, or regard. Uh, it's the word used in the parable of the winery tenants in Matthew 21, verse 37, where he read, last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. So in summary, Paul's hope was that they would regard or reverence the example of their industrious brethren and be forced to consider their ways that verse 8, they wouldn't be a burden to anyone. That verse 11, they might do their work quietly and earn their living. So again, are we right in saying that this was the apostles' intent? Absolutely. How can we be sure? Verse 15, do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. It's not about booting people out. It's not about disfellowship. Uh, it's not about withdrawing. It's got nothing to do with that. Rather, it's actually an exhortation regarding vocational idleness. And as I said in my opening remarks, I suspect no one has been disfellowship that I, I'm aware of uh, for being lazy and not working hard enough. What we have done is taking a poor reference or translation in the AV, withdrawing yourselves from every brother who walks disorderly, and use that for all manner of abuse in our community, our, our community, which is a real shame. All right, next one. 1 Timothy 1 verse 18. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child. It's slower if we turn that up. 1 Timothy 1 verse 18. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. You know, some have said this is all about handing over to Satan. Oh, that must mean disfellowship them, um, you know, or, or withdraw from them. So let, let's look at this one. So who were Hymenus and Alexander? Well, we learn from 2 Timothy 2 verse 16 that they are specifically included among those known for, quote, 
irreverent babble that would lead people into more and more ungodliness for their talk would spread like gangrene among them, uh, Hymenius and Philetus. So Paul goes on to say that they, this is in verse 16 of 2 Timothy 2, that they have swerved from the truth saying that the resurrection has already happened, thereby upsetting the faith of some. So Paul concludes in verse 19 that God's foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So from all of that, we learn that Hymenus and Alexander had rejected the faith they had departed from the truth of the gospel and they were promoting a view that the resurrection had already happened. Now that had two consequences. One, it led people into more and more ungodliness. And then we think about it. If there's no hope beyond the grave, we might as well lead a licentious life. Or as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 32, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, tomorrow we die. So this was the problem with Hymenus and Philetus. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They had rejected the faith and therefore lived an ungodly life and were leading others to, to that same path of ungodliness. Jude speaks about these sorts of people as well. In verse 4 of Jude, he, he, he refers to them as ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and persuaded, uh, sorry, and pursued unnatural desire. In like manner, these people defile the flesh, reject authority and blaspheme. They have abandoned themselves, scoffers, following their ungodly passions. So this is the point. They scoffed at the return of Christ to resurrect the dead, and therefore lived a life today, or in their day, of ungodliness. Now, Peter spoke of them also in 2 Peter 3, verse 3. We know this quote well. He said that scoffers will come in the last day with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Why? Because they'll say, oh, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. So in a nutshell, Hymenus and Philetus had not, in the words of 1 Timothy 1 verse 18, held on to their faith and their good conscience. They had rejected both. And in doing so, it led to the second consequence. They made, they made shipwreck of their faith. They left the faith. In the words of 2 Timothy 2 verse 18, they had departed or swerved from the truth. Uh, the AV for verse 19 has holding faith and a good conscience with which some having put away concerning, <coughs> concerning faith have made shipwreck. Now this word rendered put away is, is the word apophomai, which literally means to thrust or push away, push away. So it has the idea of rejecting or refusing. They had repudiated the faith. And in doing so, rather than being pushed out, disfellowship or, or whatever, they pushed themselves away from the ecclesia. Is that true? You know, is that my interpretation for, for convenience? Well, no. Um, but you might be saying, oh, well, doesn't Paul say in 1 Timothy 2 verse 2, I have handed them over to Satan. That sounds a bit more like this fellowship. I've handed them over to Satan. Is it? The AV has um, delivered unto Satan. <coughs> but does that mean this fellowship? Well, the, word, the Greek word delivered unto or handed them over actually means, and you can look this up, to permit or to allow to happen. Okay, is that a stretch? No, it's not. It's the very same word used in Ephesians 4, verse 19, where we read of those who past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. That's our word. 
to work for all uncleanness and greediness, just like Parmenas and Philetus. Very poignantly, it's the word used repeatedly in Romans 1 verse 24, where it says that God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts. Verse 26, for this cause God gave them up, receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meek. God gave them over to a reprobate. So the point is, Paul allowed them to go. They went of their own accord. They had swerved from the truth. They had left the faith. He didn't stop them. Why? Verse 20 of 1 Timothy 1, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So we can see again the positive intent of all this, that they may learn not to blaspheme. It's positive not abandoning them to the world, disfellowshipping them, cutting them off. So what does this mean? Would, would Satan teach them not to blaspheme? You know, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm handing them over to Satan that they'll learn not to blaspheme. Okay, they'll learn not to blaspheme at the feet of Satan. Sounds a bit weird. What does it mean? Well, thankfully, Paul tells us his motivation. 2 Timothy 2 verse 25, that God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and here it is, and they may come to their senses. Because in verse 19, just before that, of 2 Timothy 2, he had stated, let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. By Menas and Philetus, they had pushed themselves away from the faith. Paul's hope for his departed brethren was that they would now do the same in relation to iniquity, that they would depart from iniquity. Classic. Here's so many wonderful plays on words that Paul uses. We looked at put away. What does depart mean? The Greek word rendered depart means to withdraw or remove. He's now saying withdraw or remove yourself from iniquity. So Far from disfellowshipping them, Paul's hope was that they would now withdraw themselves from iniquity and return to the ecclesia that they had previously withdrawn themselves from. Paul's prayer was that God would grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth of the resurrection that would see them come to their senses and reject their life of self indulgence. <clears throat> That's why the AV starts verse 26, that they may recover themselves. So nothing again to do with advocating disfellowship, advocating cutting one off, or advocating withdrawing fellowship from a brother or sister. Again, quite the opposite. A section of scripture that the focus as we've seen is recovery. Now, brothers and sisters, it's worth just pausing here and asking ourselves the following questions. If, in the words of verse 25, a brother or sister has already come to their senses and learned from their mistakes, if they publicly acknowledge their sin and express their deep sorrow, and regret rather than seeking to defend or justify their actions. What is the objective of a disfellowship action in such circumstances? That they would consider their ways, learn from their mistakes, and come to their senses? But haven't they already done this? That the sin would be publicly acknowledged for what it is, rather than condone, but haven't they already done this? That they would reflect on their actions leading to remorse, but haven't they already done this? In such circumstances, I ask again, what is the point in such circumstances of this fellowship? You know, it's very interesting that in 2 Timothy 2, verse 24 to 25, it goes on to say that in seeking to recover the lost, the servant of the Lord Jesus doesn't, does exactly 
what our Lord Jesus does. The one who wouldn't break a bruised reed, who wouldn't quench a, a smoking flax. It says, the Lord's servant must be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with meekness. Those verses are right in the context of talking about these brethren and sisters who had put themselves out of the truth. So are we like our Lord Jesus? Are we true servants of the Lord Jesus based on that benchmark, which, which is obviously the only benchmark that's at all relevant? All right, our next one. <clears throat> 1 Timothy 5 verse 22. We read there, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. The AV has neither be partaker of other men's sins. Well, we might think, okay, uh, there it is. We uh, are a partaker of another man's sin if we don't, you know, disfellowship them and we associate with them and they're in the ecclesia. Well, that's taking a massive lens of the verse. You read it again, don't be hasty in laying out of hands, don't take part in the sin of others, keep yourself pure. Paul is simply advising Timothy not to take part in or join in the sin of others. Nowhere do we read in this verse, which is often used in the context of this passage, nowhere do we read anything that advocates disfellowshipping a brother or sister. Nowhere do we read in this verse anything that suggests actually that we become a partaker of the sins of a brother or sister or guilty of their sin by continuing to associate with them rather than cutting them off or withdrawing from them when they sin. Indeed, the advice uh, in relation to a brother or sister who sins is contained just two verses earlier in verse 20. As for those who persist, no less, persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all. Rebuke them, not disfellowship. Indeed, the suggestion from this verse that one becomes a partaker, one becomes guilty of another one's sin unless they excommunicate them when they've sinned, it is debunked by the very context in which the verse is found. Have a look at verse 24, uh, if you're following on there in your Bibles. Verse 24, the sins of some men are conspicuous, going before them to judgment. They're, they're obvious, they're, they're out there but the sins of others appear later. So if Paul's argument is that sin is contagious and infects all those who don't cut off the sinner, would he suggest that it's only contagious when it's conspicuous? Of course not. That would be bizarre. Totally bizarre. So what's his point? His point is to not have that sin in common, to not do as they do to not participate with them in their sin. Simple. Indeed, his counsel um, in relation to brothers or sisters who do sin is very, very different to this. This is just a really simple point. Don't run to the same excess. Don't follow their bad example. Don't um, have that sin in common. Don't do as they do. But what does he actually say when somebody sins, when a brother or sister uh, 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 sins. Well, I understand talking to Brother Trevor Crispin the other Sunday that you've recently been looking at Galatians. And there's a fascinating section in Galatians 6, verse 1, that's often actually been rested uh, and tortured to mean in our community what it doesn't mean. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you that. Um, as we go through it. So Galatians 6 verse 1, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of meekness. Keep watch on yourself lest you to be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the love of Christ, the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So what is Paul's advice when a brother or sister 
sins and they're caught in a transgression. Restore them. Restore them. Not withdraw from them. Not cut them off. Not disfellowship them. In fact, implicit in Paul's words is the fact that the instinctive reaction of one who is caught in a transgression is a sense of shame. They often separate themselves from the ecclesia. They often hide themselves, perhaps like Adam and Eve sought to do back in the garden. They perhaps don't feel comfortable uh, being at the meeting in some, on some occasions, perhaps embarrassed, ashamed. Paul's expectation, go and restore them. Follow our father's example, like the prodigal son. Seek them out, just as our God did in the garden, and seek to restore them. I think that's what God did with Adam and Eve. And why does he add, keep yourself lest you too be tempted? You know, this is all, all. Keep yourself lest you be tempted. Watch out. Don't go to a drowning person. When they're drowning, they'll pull you down. We say that in young people's talks, you know. Be careful of those on the edge. Stay away. If you get too close, you'll be dragged down with them. And true, a pragmatic thing to say, but it's got nothing to do with what Paul's meant here at all. Um, what is it, what, what, what's he actually saying? He says, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. He's saying, don't do it in a spirit of piety and self-righteousness, you know, looking down on them. Why? Because one day it might be you that needs restoring. Do it humbly. Are we right? To the context we go, as we always should. Verse 3, if anyone thinks he has something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. So the apostles advice, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual, restore them, but be humble about it. Be meek, don't be pious and condescending and judgmental. Don't be sanctimonious and holier than thou. Recognize we are not in you. We could be tempted. We could succumb to the very same sin as he argues extensively in Romans 2 that we'll look at in another study. As he said in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, very similar words. If you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. So again, nothing to do with disfellowship, nothing to do with withdrawal, as it sometimes uh, is erroneously used. All righty. 1 Timothy 6 verse 3. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, who's puffed up with conceit, understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicion, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Stop. Now, if you've got an authorized version, you've turned up 1 Timothy 6 verse 3, you'll know that the AV adds, From such we draw thyself. Now, it's important to note that these words are not in just about every single original manuscript and therefore are excluded from virtually every other single translation of the Bible. They're simply not. There. Indeed, it's quite obvious that their inclusion completely interrupts the logical flow from verse 6, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Verse 6, rather, godliness with contentment is great gain. So that's an easy one. The words are not there. And if you want to study that and its connection to the, to the church and its belief of excommunication, you're welcome to um, any reasonable scholar which, who is fair-minded, would have a big cross through those words that just don't exist. So we will spend no further time on them. And if anyone ever quoted them uh, in the spirit of this, of this fellowship conversation, it would be highly inappropriate. Titus 3 verse 9. Off with the cross, we're doing these as you note in chronological order. Titus 3, verse 9. Avoid forged controversies, genealogies, 
uh, sanctions and quarrels about the law, they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Not that such a person is warped, warped and sinful. He is self condemned. But are these people who stir up division, are they brothers and sisters? No. Very clear from verse 1 that Paul's words to Titus concern the ecclesia. You see this at the start. Um, remind them to be submissive to rules and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarrelling, to be gentle and show perfect courtesy towards all people, as in others, right? And then skipping down to verse 8, I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God, right, the brethren and sisters, may be careful to devote themselves to good works. In verse 9, Paul shifts from the ecclesia, from those who believe in God, to people or persons. And we've been introduced to these people before, those who were without the ecclesia, okay, and that were seeking to subvert the believers. Sometimes it was Judaizers. Um, and here we can see in verse 9, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law. Judaizers, again, they're unprofitable and worthless. A person like this stirs up division. Um, a person is warped and sinful, self-condemned. Hardly words the apostle would use of those in verse 8 who have believed in God. He's deliberately distinguished between a person and a brother or sister. And as I said, uh, when we're introduced to these people in 2 Timothy 2, uh, we read there that they had swerved from the truth. They were upsetting the faith of some. They were leading people into more and more ungodliness. Um, and they stood in very stark contrast to the people or the believers that Paul referred to when he quoted, the Lord knows who are his. So Paul was very concerned that these Judaizers who were not converted to the way, who had rejected Jesus and clung to the law, he was concerned that they would creep into the ecclesia and that their view would spread like gangrene. So his advice to Titus is strong. After warning them once or twice, just have nothing more to do with them. They are warped, they're sinful, they're self-condemned. They've already condemned themselves by their own actions. So again, it's got nothing to do with excommunication or withdrawing or disfellowshipping a believer, a brother or sister. All right, we've got uh, three more. I think we're going just okay for time. Hebrews 10, verse 25. We know this one well, and sadly, even until recent times, this one has been used in the context of this fellowship in our community. Hebrews 10, verse 25, we're exhorted not to neglect to meet together as is the habit, note that it's a habitual practice of some. So what's Paul's advice in relation to those um, who habitually neglect to meet together? They, their, their habit is that they don't meet, they don't come along. So what does he say, disfellowship them? Yeah, we would we would say yes. I mean, what about those famous words? You could all quote them. Absence from the Lord's table. So, okay, well then let's disfellowship them. Because that's what Hebrews 10 verse 25 says. Well, does it? It says nothing of the kind. Right? We're sort of not to neglect to meet together as a habit of some. It doesn't say to, to disfellowship those who are absent from the Lord's table. In fact, verse 24, to the context we go, what's the context of verse 24? Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. And the remainder of verse 25, encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Hardly the language of withdrawal or cutting off, or the contrary, language that's entirely relevant and consistent with all the other extracts from the letter of Hebrews on this topic. Think about chapter 12, verse 2, just two chapters over. Lift. Now that word means, in the Greek, is an ortho. Ortho, orthopedic, you know, straighten, 
orthodontist, straighten the teeth, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight orthos, straight, straight teeth, straight bones that have usually broken. Make straight paths for your feet so that which is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. What do we do? We break people. We put them out of the joint. Not just put them out of joint, we keep them right out of the joint. Very colloquial English, I know, and I apologise, but it couldn't help but say that. I mean, it's, it's perverse that the very context, chapter 12, chapter 10, is all about making straight the drooping hands. And, you know, people who neglect to meet together at the meeting are often those whose hands are hanging down, whose knees are weak, who are already lame. Why would we make it harder for them? By slamming the door in them, by driving a nail, another nail into the coffin. Paul's advice is quite the contrary. Make it easier. Make it easier. Make straight paths for their feet back to the meeting. You know that I that that word has the idea of straightening the curves. You know it's hard to go down. You know the old eagle on the hill road is full of curves. It's not easy. Make it easy. Nice, clean, straight roads. And it also has the expression of filling in the valleys and flattening the peaks. Going up and down. If you're doing a marathon, up and down hills is hard. He's saying make it easy. Flatten out the peaks, cut off the peaks, fill in the valleys, make a really flat, clean, straight highway back to the ecclesia. What do we sometimes do? Oh, you've been absent from the Lord's table for a while, so I'm going to make you permanently absent. Bizarre. Lift up the hands, strengthen the knees, build a highway for them back to the ecclesia so that that which is already laid may not be dissipated any Further, with the goal, verse 15, that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Is that what we do? Remember in our first study, we quoted Mahatma Gandhi, the true measure of any society, any ecclesia, can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. How do we treat the lame? There's a lot of lame in India. That's why Gandhi talked about this. How do we treat our lame? That they be not put out of joint, but rather healed. James 5 verse 16 says, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, you know what? I've got to say this. I don't know about you, but it's pretty sad that in heaps of parts of our community, we're not that honest. We're not that open with each other. It's a real shame that very few would are, of us would have to trust and confidence, confess our faults to one another for fear of the consequence. For fear that we'll be disfellowship rather than pray for with the intent that, that, that we might be healed. This happened, brothers and sisters, in the last two months. You know, one of our brethren and sisters confessed their fault to another. Boom. Result, this fellowship. Is that the context of James' words in James 5 verse 16? Absolutely. Verse 19, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wanderings will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. You know that Greek word brings him back and brings back. They're the same word, epistropho, epistropho, which means to turn back, not turn away. Are we turning people away, brothers and sisters, or turning them back? Are we saving souls from death or cutting them adrift? Are we covering the multitude of sins or intent on exposing them for all the world to see, announcing them for all the world to hear? 
You know, there's a really moving word uh, or occurrence of this Greek word of epistrophe, and it's in Luke 22, verse 31, 32, in relation to one who denied his Lord. You know, if, if someone denied our Lord today, what would we do today? Well, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. I know you'll be shattered. But he says, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. What he's saying, he's saying, when you've got back up off the ground, I know you will weep bitterly upon denying me. But when you've got back off the ground, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail, that you will get back on your feet and you will strengthen the ecclesia. Is that how we treat those whose faith fails them, such that they deny their Lord? You know, going all the way back to Hebrews 10, verse 26. What if one was to even go on sinning deliberately to the point of verse 29, trampling on the foot the Son of God and profaning the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and outraged the spirit of grace? Surely Paul would recommend this fellowship in such circumstances. No, verse 30. We know him who said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The living God will judge his people. As has been said before, ought we not to leave him just a little bit to judge? So again, we can see that Hebrews uh, 10 and verse 25 has absolutely nothing to do with justifying his fellowship. Two more. Second John verse 10, we read there, if anyone comes to you and does not, no doubt if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, uh, bring the teaching of the truth, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. So again, as always, to the context we go. Verse 1, the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth, not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us, sticking along, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us, from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly to find some, note that, some of your children walking in the truth. So the context, brethren and sisters, is the truth. And John's concern for the elect lady and her children, some of whom were no longer walking in the truth. That takes us to verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world. They're not brethren and sisters, they're in the world. Those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, they're not brothers and sisters. They're not believers. Such an one is the deceiver and the antichrist. And we're not talking about brethren and sisters here at all. Watch yourself so that you may not lose what we have worked for. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ, they're not buying the teaching. They don't have God. It's in that context that we get verse 10. If someone like that comes to you and does not bring this teaching that I've shared with you, John saying, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. So John's warning the elect lady that if one of these deceivers, these antichrists, should come to her house, they should tread very carefully to avoid losing all that she and the apostle had worked so hard to see, namely that her children would abide in the truth. John's concern is that more children of the elect lady would just be deceived and therefore no longer walk in truth. So his advice then, verse 10, if someone, one of them comes to you, don't welcome them into your family home. As to do so would be to share fellowship to take part in a meal, as the Greek word koinonio is often rendered, it would be to partake in a meal with a deceiver, with the antichrist. So John's very wise counsel um, is to not do that. So again, 
a verse that has absolutely nothing to do with disfellowshipping a brother or sister who sins. Indeed, it's very clear from the letter that these deceivers, these were deceivers, antichrists, not in their pleasure. They are from without. Verse 7, they've gone out into the world. Verse 10, if anyone comes to you, don't receive him into And then further nowhere in this passage do we read that we become a partaker of the sins of a brother or sister or that we become guilty by associating with them unless we cut them off or withdraw from them when they sin. Nowhere. As with many of the other passages we've looked at, John's concern is in relation to someone who is not in the truth, who doesn't know the truth, in whom the truth doesn't abide. These are all from one John, that's two John. Um, who doesn't walk in the truth, one who's a deceiver, one who doesn't confess that Christ came in the flesh, one who doesn't abide in the teaching of Christ, one who doesn't have God, the Antichrist. He's talking about them, not a brother or sister. His advice if is if one like that comes to you, don't welcome into your house. Don't fellowship with someone like that who has all those destructive ideologies. For if you do, you might lose more of your children from the truth, which would be so sad, given how hard you've worked together to see them walking in the truth. So yes, yes, it is a verse that makes it clear that ours is not a fellowship to be shared with those not in the truth, these antichrists, right? Yes, that would be a valid use of this passage. But again, it's not a verse that has anything to do with disfellowshipping a brother or sister. All right, our very last one, Revelation 18, verse 4. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you take part, fellowship, in her sins, lest you share in her plans. Again, through the context we go. Verse 2, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. All nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. Who are we referring to? It's clearly a reference to the Catholic system whose sins in verse 5 are heaped high as heaven. We could stop there, really. Uh, it's got nothing to do with brethren and sisters. But we'll go on a little more, um, just to pull out a few points here. The message from heaven is, therefore, in verse 4, their, their sins are heaped high as heaven. What does heaven say? God says, through Christ, uh, verse 4, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. The point is, in the language of 1 Peter 2 verse 9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. So the message from God is, as God's people, come out of it. Don't become part of that immoral, licentious order of things. So yes, again, a verse that does make it clear that ours is not an open fellowship. But again, another verse that has nothing to do with disfellowshipping a brother or sister. And again, nowhere in this passage do we read that we become a partaker of the sins of a brother or sister or that we become guilty by associating with them unless we cut them off or withdraw from them when they sin. As with so many of the passages, we've repeated this a number of times that we've looked at, we're dealing with parties outside the ecclesia. In this case, Babylon the Great. The council is, as we've seen again previously, very simple and wise. Separate yourselves from such a corrupt and in moral order, lest you get caught up in her sin and thereby share in her judgment. I just wanted to conclude with just a few minutes more to bust this myth that we can somehow become guilty of the sin of a brother or sister. 
So here's the standard line that people would advocate who believe that. Brother or sister sins in a meeting, we must disfellowship them, we must cut them off, um, or we effectively become guilty by continuing to associate with them. Okay, excellent. Is that Bible? Is that spiritual? Luke 7, verse 37. We read, Behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at Jesus' feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And when the Pharisee, we sometimes think like a Pharisee, now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw at his fate within himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touched him, for she is a sinner. Point being, Jesus is ceremonially clean. You're infected by her sin. You shouldn't be associating with a sinner. You're guilty by association. You've become a sinner. You've a partaker in her sin. You're infected by her sin, like, like topical with COVID. Of course not. Think of all sick, the lepers, the blind, the deaf, the dumb, the diseased, the dead, that Jesus very deliberately touched. Why? To explode the myth of ceremonial uncleanness that Jews held so dear. Pray God that we would learn this lesson and not perpetuate the myth. Let's remember that the longest conversation Jesus is recorded as having is with a Samaritan, a people who worshipped what they did not know, a race that the Jews had nothing to do with because they were ceremonially unclean. And it was a conversation which caused the Lord's disciples to marvel because it was a woman living in adultery, no less. Brothers and sisters, when one of our own sins, we are not infected by their sin. We are not a partaker in their sin just because we have something to do with them. We don't become guilty of their sin unless we cut them off or withdraw from them. Thankfully, sin is not COVID. Sin is not infectious disease transmitted from person to person by direct or indirect contact. Else, it could not have been said of our Lord, a friend of sinners, and who was touched by sinners, that he was without sin. It's a myth, and we ought not to perpetuate it. All right, that's it in terms of going through all the verses that I could think of that I use to advocate this fellowship or withdrawal. And I hope sincerely that um, you, you certainly don't have to agree with everything I've said. That's just fine. But I hope that it's been cause for thought um, when we next consider a sad circumstance or consider those verses. So Shane, with that, I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brother David. Um, <clears throat> yeah, amazing uh, consideration. I think a uh, very um, a thoughtful consideration on on what some people find difficult um, to sometimes understand, but even uh, just to deal with on a on a um, personal uh, basis. But I think what you've emphasised is really uh, the importance of reading your Bible very carefully and trying to understand what it's saying behind. And if you do, as you very eloquently pointed out, um, what you'll see is the message is to uh, restore and not withdraw. And I think that was um, a key message. Uh, that came out of a lot of our considerations tonight. Uh, and it's a much more positive message, I think, um, wanting to, the best for people rather than to uh, to, to chop them off, um, one of God's children. Um, so yes, uh, I don't uh, have any announcements, but to be fair, under the circumstances and the uh, currently very fluid um, arrangements that we have, uh, I'm assuming that um, people just need to look out for uh, emails from uh, Brother Dave Healy, um, maybe Facebook group. Uh, also, um, maybe we need to activate our uh, pod groups on WhatsApp or, 
or email or whatever we um, decided to do. Uh, and just make sure everybody um, knows what's going on uh, over the next week um, in terms of communications. Um, once again, Dave, I'd really like to thank you for uh, joining with us tonight and uh, expanding God's word. Uh, and uh, I'll just close with prayer now. Our dear Father in heaven, uh, thank you so much for the hour of consideration of your word that we've just had. Um, we are truly thankful for uh, the depth of, of knowledge and the depth of understanding uh, that we can get from your word, uh, which is life. Uh, it, it gives us instruction. It gives us um, a way of treating each other, helping each other, and uh, all with the aim of getting to your kingdom. So uh, thank you so much for these instructions. May we uh, read them, understand them, and help us to apply them in our lives so that we all might, through your grace, see that wonderful day uh, in, in your kingdom. Father, please be with us as we uh, get through this next week of lockdown. Um, again, help us all to reach out and to um, show uh, love and kindness and, and uh, thoughtfulness and inclusivity in our actions and our activities. Um, help us to trust in you, Father. You are in control and that uh, you can help us through this. So, um, Father, we ask this now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.